Hello again, and welcome to FateWorks. I'm Jim Grant, and every week it's my pleasure to introduce you to interesting people whose faith and work come together in a career, in a vocation, in a life. We've had people that are my brother. We've had people from Catholic Relief. We've had singers and dancers. We've had musicians. We've had priests and sisters. We've had missionaries. But today we have someone who I would say is one of my favorite guests to ever be on a program because I've known Dennis for almost 20 years. He has been hosting programs here at KNXT for our Portuguese-speaking community for 26 years. That program is one in which he brings, as I do, but even more interesting people, poets, musicians, dancers, literary geniuses, politicians, people of education, people that are his colleagues, people that are his students. And week after week, Dennis brings us the Portuguese culture over these airways. So Dennis, it is a joy to finally do a FaithWorks with you to let you tell us just a little bit about what it's like being the outstanding foreign language <laughs> teacher in California, which I did mean to mention was a recent award that Dennis received recently in Monterey. Imagine the first time a Portuguese language professor among the thousands of foreign language teachers in secondary level that our own Dennis Borges was awarded this award in front of all of his great colleagues and friends. So let's begin. Tell us a little bit about Dennis Borges, who I think only came over to this country when you were like 10 years old. Correct. How did that happen? Why did you emigrate to here? And how did your life move along as a young boy, 10 years old? Well, uh, thanks for inviting me, Jim. And thanks for the great work you do here at, uh, uh, at the diocese. I, um, there's a saying in the Azores, um, every Azorian has a cousin in the Americas. <laughs> there's no one, and literally there is no one I know that lives in the Azores, which are a group of islands, as you know, owned by Portugal off the coast of Portugal in the Atlantic North, that do not have a relative in the United States. Oh, or in the Americas, not just in the U.S., in the U.S. or Canada or Brazil, because that was our first immigration. Um, the Azores first immigrated to Brazil when Brazil was discovered in the 1500s, or 1500, and then it was colonized by Portugal. However, here to the States, um, we all came for various reasons. Our first immigrants came, as many Europeans did. Our first were actually um, folks that were men uh, that uh, were in the whale hunting industry from New Bedford and okay. from Nantucket and from those areas, they would go to the Azores or the, uh, the waters around the Azores where there's lots of, there were lots of whales or still are some, and they would hunt the whales. They had to go in a skeleton crew because they had to bring a lot of weight back yep. to, to, to the States. So they would go with a very skeleton crew to the, to, to the and then they would recruit men to oh, right. to do this whale hunting in the in the late 1700s and, and throughout the 1800s, and so um, that was where our first immigration came here, essentially in the early 1800s to the East Coast, and then of course the gold rush in California brought many of them here. But we were here before the gold rush because we had also were part of the whale uh, industry in Monterey and in, 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 in that area of Northern California. My family is a little bit different. My grandfather in 1910. Um, came to the United States, as many young men did at the time, uh, in hopes of a better life. Portugal had some very tough economic uh, times, and he came over, went through, had this wonderful um, keepsake of his, my family does, I don't have it, I hope to get it, um, it where he came through Ellis Island, wow. and uh, like many Euro Europeans, and uh, made his way to California uh, with a couple of bucks in his pocket, that's all he had and uh, stayed here, lived here 18 years, uh, married my grandmother. He was uh, single for nine years, married for nine years, and then 18 years later, he decided that he wanted to go back home. And uh, with five daughters, um, he sold his ranch in uh, east of Tulare, uh, his ranch and his cows, and uh, made quite a bit of money. He was very lucky. He sold his ranch six months before the Depression, oh when my. things were really oh, yeah. high up as far as, you know, 
six months before the Depression, the Great Depression. And he uh, went back to Portugal, and then three other daughters were born. My mother's one of eight girls, and large family. And so um, then with the economic situation in the 1950s, my aunts who were born in the United States started immigrating as they got married in the early 50s. My mom um, was not born in the States, so she could not come over, but then the Family Reunification Act, which was passed through John F. Kennedy and the, that administration and the, the Johnson administration, um, to, uh, and the Immigration Act of 1965, later on, uh, changed the laws to where there was the so-called family reunification. In other words, if you had a brother or sister in another country and you wanted to reunite with them, you, there was a process to be done. It took about a year and a half to two years. And, um, and that's how my mom and my other two aunts who were not born in the United States came. Every one of them except two of my aunts that were, uh, came to the, to the U.S. So we came at the age of 10. My dad wanted to come to the U.S. to make money like my grandfather sure. and to be here four or five years. That was his uh, plan, uh, to be here five years and uh, to work and then go back. He had his home there. He had a little bit of land. And f almost 50 years later here, I, I still am. And he's passed away, unfortunately. But here we are. We still are. So it's our home, obviously. How did you, with this wonderful background of all this um, part of being in two worlds, uh, the Azores and, and, and California, how did it turn out that you became so interested in culture, language, and teaching, which is your life, which you have shared in all your career? I've always wanted to do it since I was a young man, but we came over, my dad's dream was to go back. Um, and I, um, I, 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 I wanted to continue. I, I loved teaching Portuguese. I was actually at the age of ten going to uh, in, go into the seminary when I was uh, at the age of ten. Yeah, that, that's a little unknown fact uh, because um, it, it's uh, at the time in the Azores, we were you know there was lots of uh, you know uh, there were not a lot of economic opportunities, and the seminary offered a lot of opportunities, uh, not only to become a priest but also to get an education. And so uh, lots of young men in that, of my generation, uh, went into the seminary. Many of them ended up in the priesthood, others did not, but uh, got one of the best educations there was in Portugal at the time. The seminary was like a, uh, one of the top-notch universities, uh, and it still is in many places in the world. And so what happened, um, we, uh, when, the, uh, when I came over, I really liked uh, learning, I really liked, but I had a, you know, a little bit of issue, of course, you know, changing with the language to English and everything else. And I had a couple of cousins of mine who were one of them in the seminary and the other one was in the high school uh, there and they would send me books. I, we made this pact, you know, send me books so I can continue my Portuguese studies on my own. And that's basically how I did a lot of it. Um, I had to go milk cows like because my dad wanted, really wanted to get into the dairy business. And so I wasn't able to go and get my education when I wanted to at the end of high school. So I ended up going uh, into, into um, commercial business and at the same time started a Portuguese radio program. I was 17 years old, wow. <laughs> kind of, you know, <laughs> dumb, <laughs> uh, or at least, I don't know about that, but I was, I was you know, young yeah. and naive, let's put it that yeah. way. Uh, and I started a Portuguese wow. radio station, uh, Portuguese radio program, one wow. hour a week wow. uh, when I was 17. When I was 20, I started a Portuguese, 22, I, was start, I started a Portuguese radio station. The first Portuguese radio station in the valley and in California was 24 hours. We were on closed circuit, not, you know, regular, but closed circuit. And so that's how my love for the language developed. I was involved in radio, so I was really, uh, you know, I had to prep myself, you know, to, to do these radio programs. And so that's one of the reasons how I got really involved. Later on, I went to back to school, I finished my degree, and got into teaching. There's so many degrees and so much education, so much teaching. Um, all of a sudden, you're, you're teaching on many levels secondary and university at the same time. At a community college, yeah. How is it that you are finding the evolution of education in, in your own career, both in secondary ed and at the university level? Oh, how are you finding how things are, are things, going? Things change, but, but you know, things can't be static. Education cannot be static or else it's not education. But uh, I believe, you know, that, um, you know, uh, sometimes education gets a bad rap, but I believe that, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of good, great educators out there. I think we have some great schools, you know, both private and public. Um, I think, you know, uh, I think that students, the majority of students that I have in my classroom really do want to learn. 
Uh, and, uh, and so I believe that, uh, you know, it's still the way out for, it's still the way forward for any society, and especially folks like myself, for example, that came from a country that, you know, the only, our way was basically either getting into business or get into, you know, uh, get an education and go to, go to college and, 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 and for yourself. So uh, I believe that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of good things happening in education. There's lots of good things happening in Portuguese language education, which is good, you know, and which is exactly where I wanted to go because you have been teaching and have had many, many awards for different levels of your education, different things you've done with community, different things you've done at schools. But this most recent award is the one that is really the grand prize. Well, I don't know if it's a grand prize, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to be honored by your peers. It's nice, to, you know, when, when, when the California Language Institute, you know, decided to put my name forth or one of, the, of their uh, subsidiaries decided to put my name forth. I actually didn't want to because I thought it should go to a younger teacher. Um, I've been in education for 22 years. I'm not that far off from my retirement, uh, at least from secondary education. And I thought maybe if you give it to a younger teacher, and this, uh, and I spoke to the people wow. two years in a row, I thought if you give it to a younger teacher, it might be a little bit more of an incentive than me who um, may be, you know, four or five years away from my retirement from secondary education. I want to continue with my college uh, teaching career. Um, but, you know, they decided to advance with my name. I didn't think I would have had a chance because there's a lot of great educators out there. There's a lot of great language teachers out there, and I've seen them all. Um, that the one, I haven't seen them all, but the ones I have seen, you know, and observed are some great teachers. And, and there's, you know, and Portuguese is not a very well-known language. It's the sixth most spoken language on earth, but it's not, it's the least, it's one of the least taught languages in the United States of America. Uh, and so we only have, for example, nine high schools in California out of the 4,000 high schools that teach Portuguese. That's what I wanted to say, is that it was a special blessing that Portuguese was it awarded was. Yeah. because it had not happened before. Therefore, they really were locking in on this important language, which in the second half of the program, we're going to have you share a little bit more, Guinness, about how important for you and for the community here in the valley and in the world Portuguese is. So hearing that it's the sixth most spoken language in the world, speaking of Brazil Correct. having so many gazillion people and Portugal and the Azores, but all the communities of Portuguese Americans. We'll talk more. One last thought though before we take our break. Is there something you want to say about what it is to be able to use Channel 49 as a way for you as a platform? We'll just have you tease us a little bit about that, and then we'll take our break. Well, I think Channel 49 has been very important to the Portuguese American community. It's been a blessing to our community. And uh, even in today's era where we have you know, all kinds of technology, it is a way for us to have our local community um, uh, share what we do and in, in, uh, in this part of, uh, uh, of the valley. And so, yeah, we can nowadays, you know, get on the phone and find out what's happening in Portugal, but we cannot sometimes find out what's happening in our own community. And I think Channel 49 with the, with the programming uh, dedicated to the Portuguese American community has been really, and so, and right now, the only voice that we really have because we no longer have Portuguese radio, local Portuguese radio. We have a Portuguese newspaper, but it comes out of the Northern California. It serves the whole entire state, so it's not a local newspaper. Um, and so, actually, as far as local programming, it's what we have here in Channel 49. So it's been a real blessing for our community. Well, you've been a blessing. So has Lucy Noya. So have all the programs that we've done here in Portuguese. Nossa Fe. These programs yes. are very important for us. And we'll be right back, so stay tuned. Go to knxd.tv. You'll discover that your Catholic television station is streaming live on the web. Just click on the live broadcast icon to open. It's KNXT Live on the web, just as you see it on television. Broadcasting live by video streaming 24-7. The only television station in the valley that brings its programming to you and the world anytime, anyplace, anywhere. And it's only here at knxt.tv. 
Celebrate Sunday Mass with KNXT from beautiful St. Anne's Chapel every Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and again at 5 p.m. This weekly broadcast of the Sunday Mass has become the cornerstone of diocesan evangelization, touching thousands of viewers, both Catholic and non-Catholic alike, with the Word of God and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Sunday Mass from St. Anne's Chapel, 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. on KNXT-TV, your Catholic television station. Welcome back to our second half of our program called FaithWorks. Our guest today is Dennis Borges, who has been here at Channel 49 about 26 years, which would make it longer than I've been here at, 20, at 49. Congratulations. Thank you. Somebody's been here longer <laughs> than I have. That is amazing. It makes me feel young. <laughs> you are young. Uh, yeah, really. Um, what Dennis is going to tell us now after I ask the question is to let us into a little bit about teaching. Because this is what Dennis really is. In his essence, it was so easy to write a little report for Dennis, a little letter to his uh, uh, the person, uh, Dr. Duarte Silva, Silva mm -hmm. that we needed to say something. Easy. Because every program that Dennis does is very educational. It's illustrative of an approach to learning, to the, the joy of sharing information in every form, every form of culture. So... Let's begin with your high school student. We're going to be able to show a clip now of um, these wonderful students that you bring us every year. We clear out the studio and they dance for us. Tell us about those students, what they're like when they're not here with us, how hard it is to learn those steps. And while we're watching, let's talk over the clip. Who are these kids? Sure. Well, uh, we've started this part of the of the of the of the. Of the teaching. Uh, I've been teaching Portuguese for 22 years. However, uh, it's been about 15 years. I was into my seventh or eighth year of teaching when um, all of us, we used to do and we still do a cultural uh, fair and we were at the cultural fair and one, I had contacted one young man at the time to uh, teach a couple of steps, you know, just some very basic steps and the kids took on a liking to it. So I worked it into my curriculum with the blessing of my administration uh, at both at the school and the district level. And now it's an integral part of Portuguese 4 and 5. Um, so we work our curriculum really well. I mean, we, we do all the language activities that we need to do. And then we usually take a few minutes uh, from every single class and we learn a few of these songs. It, the wonderful thing about it, it's student-led, as the viewers will be able to see. I'm not there. So every year, one student will take charge, and sometimes two students will take charge. And they're the ones that call, they're the ones that teach their, their, their peers. So it's really a, a, um, a, a, an important aspect of our class. There's a lot of camaraderie with it. Um, the students, um, it started as a very small class. It was one of my smallest classes at the time. I usually had about 24 to 26 students in Portuguese 4. Uh, this last year, and, uh, and I thank Channel 49 for doing this, we always now do two programs because we, and we break the class in half because this last year I had 46 students, which is not easy for those uh, who are out there watching uh, uh, that are teachers. It's not easy having 46 teenagers in one classroom <laughs> at one time for two hours. However, I think they, they, they we, and I have students from all ethnic backgrounds. My students are not just the Portuguese background, okay? Right now, for example, and not in the dancing, in that advanced class about, I would say about 45% of my students are from Portuguese background. But the other 60% or the other 55% are not. Oh. They are Hispanics. They are lots of Latin kids who, uh, who, want, who know Spanish and want to learn Portuguese as a third language. Uh, I have uh, students of other ethnicities who, uh, for some reason, would like to take a, 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 another language. And so I have students not just of Portuguese background. And, and, and that is what's great. That's what's great about cyclical. And I have this, we, besides this great thing that we do at Channel 49, I, I appreciate all the channel does for us because I know it's a lot of work. Uh, besides coming here, we have a program that we go through to different schools, elementary schools nice. in Tulare County, and we're open to going to other counties. But in Tulare County, elementary schools, junior highs, and a couple of high schools in other counties in Kings County, we've come up here to Fresno, to Fresno State, and um, and and so we promote, you know, uh, uh, the, this this cultural traditional of the traditional dances from the Azores. These dances are some of them are like 300 years old. And so uh, we promote this. And when we go to high, when we go to elementary schools, if I can just tell one little anecdotal story, here about um, 
uh, three, a little bit longer than that, it was last school year, so I would say about a year ago, I had uh, the, uh, this wonderful picture, uh, uh, the portrait that was taken of these, this uh, uh, Af African American young lady and this Hispanic young man who are, were in my classroom just graduated and they're both at Fresno State, they're great, great kids. And they were teaching oh, these two really? kids how to dance Portuguese dances and these two kids their grandparents had come from the Azores. Oh. So how culture can be cyclical when we open it to other cultures, when we let others come in and share what we have, okay? And so if this class was just for Portuguese kids, it would only be Portuguese-based kids, but it, obviously the class is open to everybody, and we have lots of kids from all different ethnicities that really want to take part in this cultural experience. You know, I, I thought it was enough that you were able to get such good work done with Portuguese Americans, Azorean Americans, but to now hear that it's much broader than oh, that. Yeah. There is an interest in this course and in the language and in the culture way beyond. Yeah. Now that brings up a topic of something that you wrote. Well, it was published today in the um, Portuguese Times. A Portuguese school in every Portuguese community in California, a possible and absolutely necessary utopia by Dennis Borges. Tell us about that essay. And what is your conviction that this important quality of culture and language has to be passed on and it has to be spread out in more schools? Schools have to, schools have to do this. We have to keep our culture going. Yeah, I think that all of our Portuguese-American organizations that we have in the Valley, and we have a very rich tradition with the festas, as you know, you know, with the different, uh, you know, many of them tied into our local parishes. Uh, and uh, the different uh, processions and, and fashions that happen for the Holy Spirit, for Our Lady of Fatima, uh, St. John, and some of the other uh, popular fashions that happen and bring us into the streets. And, you know, we celebrate with lots of, uh, usually with lots of uh, food and music and, and fun times. However, um, as the community becomes much more Americanized and less Portuguese, if we want to call it that way, as far as not knowing the language, we have, you know, like, I've, like I mentioned to you, my grandfather immigrated in 1910, so we have lots of people. Uh, our first immigration that we know of into Tulare County is in the 1880s, and the same thing to Fresno County. So we're talking about Portuguese Americans have been here for, you know, 100, right after the state became a state. So uh, basically we've been here for, you know, over 130, 140 years. And so there are Portuguese of third generation, of fourth generation, um, who do not speak the language, okay? And I think that it's important to have a school. Hopefully, it will be at, an, at a public school, at one of our public schools that we have throughout California or a private school also. Hopefully, it's at a school where students attend and they can learn and share because I think the great thing about what we do in Tulare and some of the other schools, Hillmar is another school that has Portuguese also in this area, and is that the students are there with their own peers you know, learning the language and also being able to share with other ethnicities who are their friends and their neighbors. That is, of course, the ideal situation. However, sometimes, you know, schools are strapped for money and there isn't the love of languages, unfortunately, in, in, in the United States that we have in other parts of the world. That's just the way it is. It's not, you know, it's not a knock on us. It's just the way we are. Uh, and it's part of our, of our, of our system. However, um, I think that if where it is not available, where the community cannot get organized and hopefully get a school board to accept this idea that Portuguese being the sixth most spoken language on earth deserves to have a place in the curriculum, then I think our Portuguese American organizations have to step in and start maybe a private school. There, you know, there's nothing wrong with private schools. A private school, there's one at St. Aloysius Catholic Church, for example. We are blessed that we have two things. We have, we have a, 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 an evening school called Escola Vitorino de Mesio. That's part of the Portuguese Center of Evangelization and Culture that uh, Father Marta started, that I was part of it for many, many years. And Father Marta is out also, but he was also part of it. He was the one that began it. And, and so we, at that school, it's, just, it's a, a school that functions on a Monday night for about two and a half hours. But in those two and a half hours, once a week, kids are able to learn a little bit of the language, a little nice. bit of the culture. And I think we're, and it's a great feeder for our schools, of course. Yeah. But if you don't have the luxury of having a high school in your town that has, you know, Portuguese, and you want your kids to learn a little bit of Portuguese, whether you're a Portuguese background or any other ethnicity, I think the Portuguese American organizations need to step in a little bit. And it's a way also to bring the community together through language, through culture, uh, and, and, and all that embodies, you know. 
So I, I, I think there's, I, I mean, the essay is obviously, it's twofold, but, you know, it serves the purpose of hopefully putting our Portuguese Americans in different parts of the states, in different parts of the United States, because, uh, as you said, it was published by the Portuguese Times in New Bedford, but it was also published here in California, um, that we think about, you know, what, how we can be a little bit outside the box nowadays. You know, our organizations can serve as, fest, as, as, as festa centers, as things that we celebrate, but also uh, uh, teaching on an ongoing basis to the young people. Uh, something that I think they have a fundamental right, which is to know where their ancestors came from and a little bit about the country of their ancestors. Absolutely. Are there certain guests or programs that you might like to mention to remind our viewers these are the people that have been on the programs that have enriched the community. Our production team did an outstanding job with the president of the government, Yezers, when he was here, and we were able to produce a couple different shows with that visit. The Luzo American Education Foundation Conference, which was done here two years ago in Tulare and Tipton area, and again, our, we, we covered that. We've had, you know, a couple of uh, uh, Azorian poets here and some authors. Lidwin Dubodova has been here. Um, and, we've had, uh, and we've had, you know, uh, different people. Every time there's somebody from Portugal that comes over, we try to squeeze in, and Channel 49 has been great about, you know, uh, working with me on that. We try to, because it gives the community an opportunity to learn a little bit more about, you know, these, these people who visit, who sometimes, you know, are here only here for 24 hours, but who take an interest in this part of the world, you know, uh, where the community has such, you know, strong ties to, to, to the Central Valley. Well, I know why they come, because they want to meet the Honorary no, Consul No, no, that's of, not the reason. No, <laughs> Honorary Consul of Portugal right here in Tulare. Yeah, Tell us just a little bit about that, because that's a wonderful connection for you well, with it's Portugal. Uh, I've been involved in Portuguese community all my life, as, as you know, with Channel 49, with the schools, before that with the Portuguese organizations, with the Centro Português, the Portuguese Evangelization Cultural Center in Tulare. Um, I was on the second board with Father Marta and him and I. I did a literary symposium for 14 years in Tulare that we used to bring anywhere between 15 to 20 writers uh, from Portugal and different parts of the, uh, of, of, uh, the Portuguese American academic world. So um, after a few years, um, they, they've decided to kind of have these people who are honorary consuls, and we can re we represent Portugal, we can do some services for the community. Um, I really didn't want to do it because I didn't have any time, but uh, here I am doing it now. And you do it, and we're so <laughs> glad you've done it for 26 years here yes, at KNXT, 22 years teaching, as you said, secondary education and community college. We are so proud of Dennis Borges and the whole Azorian community here. It's enriched our lives at KNXT, and we are so glad that we're finally able to have a program in English because week after week, the Portuguese-speaking community has been enriched with Dennis and Lucia and Fatima, and we want to say thank you, and we'll see you next month in next month's FaithWorks. Till then, God bless. <laughs>